speak about the discovery of deep progress, uh, which is a term I made up. Um, because we're talking about progress, which the Victorians knew all about, or at least they thought they knew all about it. The Great Exhibition of 1851 was, of course, uh, a great exhibition about progress, about the great progress that had made, been made in science and industry and so on. And for those who lived in this era, they believed they were living in an era of progress. There was new... Oh, that didn't work. Oh, dear. Sorry. There's supposed to be a train in this slide. <laughs> the, that's that famous um, early footage, the, the first film of a train moving towards the, the screen. It's not working. It doesn't matter. And so they lived in the era of the, 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 the locomotive. And far more important, I think, than we now remember was, of course, the steamship. This is far more impressive to the Victorians than the train because the steamship was the largest and the most complex moving object ever seen on the face of the earth. And they had made it. They lived in the era in which these new great things had been constructed, which could move against the wind at any time uh, all around the world. So, just, just to give you a, a, an idea of the, the, the briefest summary of the number of books and titles and articles about progress in Victorian Britain. This is just the, the, the briefest search I did on, uh, on the internet for titles of books in the Victorian era on the title uh, w with progress in their title. And of course, one could lengthen this a hundredfold Progress was indeed uh, one of the biggest themes. One sees this in an area that is very often overlooked in phrenology, the bump reading science where you could feel the bumps in someone's head and find out about their character and their abilities and so on and so forth. Um, and this man, George Coombe, was the leading proponent of phrenology. But bump reading aside, he wrote an extremely influential book called The Constitution of Man in 1828, which was in print throughout the century, which was one of the best-selling books of the 19th century. Uh, it, not, we're leaving aside to fiction and so on and so forth, because those have a different selling rate. But this book was about how human beings are constituted as progressive, that the laws of nature are founded on a progressive theme and that human beings need to align themselves with the laws of nature in order to continue to progress. Now this book, I mean, I'm sure few of you have heard of this, but this book far outsold the other books you might think of in the same genre. I mean, the uh, Vestiges of Creation, that hugely controversial uh, evolutionary book, is dwarfed by the sales of Constitution of Man. Darwin's Origin of Species, again, also totally dwarfed by this, by this book. So Coombe's Constitution of Man, because he was a phrenologist, uh, wasn't that respectable. So his name very quickly dropped away, but his message of progress and natural laws leading everything and that you need to align your life with that was extremely... Um, acceptable to his audience. And so it, it, catch, it, it caught on unlike anything you could imagine. When he died in uh, 1858, the obituary said that no man had influenced the society of the 19th century like this man, even though he was mo unknown to so many people because his doctrine of progress and natural laws had been picked up on and copied by so many other writers. Uh, I did my PhD on this, so which is why I know about, why I know about it. Um, so one can, if you know what you're looking for, you can recognize his talk about progress and natural laws in lots of other works that don't mention him. 
Um, but there are lots of other areas where one sees this. In the popular astronomer, Nick, uh, John Pringle Nichols, <coughs> in this book, described how solar systems are formed by a progressive series of dust and debris revolving around a plane according to gravity and gradually forming into planets and suns. So that even in space, a progressive series uh, forms, is what forms nature. Now, mostly I'm going to be talking about natural history as a different area. And first of all, with the geologist James Hutton, who is generally credited with the one who uh, established the idea of what we call deep time. That's where I cheated and got the name deep progress from. This is an established concept, deep time. Traditionally, people had thought that the world was only a few thousand years old based on uh, a reading of the Bible and the generations of people and prophets mentioned there, they had concluded the world was about 6,000 years old. But uh, many geologists, not just Hutton, examining the actual fabric of the Earth itself, had found that, gosh, the, the world is in fact very, very old. The Earth itself is extremely ancient. And Hutton is widely uh, credited with establishing this with things like this. This is called um, Hutton's unconformity because uh, geological strata, sedimentary strata, are deposited horizontally as mud and silt settle down from oceans or lakes horizontally. Such beds are originally laid down like this, horizontally. But in this particular feature, which is a cliff in Scotland, he found a place where the beds were in fact lined vertically. And so what he realized had happened here was that these beds, which had originally, of course, been laid down horizontally, had, after they'd been laid down, somehow been turned vertically under the earth. And then they had been raised up to the surface where erosion had occurred. That's what this layer here is. Then, the whole surface, the, this whole area of the earth had gone down under the sea again, and more layers had been deposited above them, and then the whole thing had been raised up so that it was now the surface of a cliff, which you could see above the ocean, no longer under, sea, under the sea, as it had originally been. And as he showed his colleagues, even one layer, one little strip would be countless thousands or millions of years to deposit. When you counted up this entire process, he argued that the world was, as far as human beings are concerned, infinite, unbelievably ancient. And so one of his colleagues, John Playfair, who observed this on a tour with Hutton said, to those of us who saw this, the mind seemed to grow giddy, glancing into the, the depth of time. And so this is where the idea comes from, of, of deep time, that, 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 that the age of the, the world was far beyond that of any human imagination or human reckoning or human history. Human history is, of course, only four or five or 6,000 years old. But here, the world was understood by these early geologists to be countless millions of years old. But what about fossils? Fossils have, of course, been known throughout human history. This is uh, a famous vase, the Hesion vase, about 550 BC, which apparently has a fossil on it. That's what these figures are shooting their arrows at, but it's of course been figured as a Greek monster, a mythological monster. This is the way in which the Greeks, the Romans, and other ancient peoples handled the discovery of fossils. They incorporated them into their myths and legends. Here is, of course, this rather intriguing example. 
These were found throughout the Mediterranean. Could they be the origin of the idea of the Cyclops? After all, this is an elephant skull, by the way. Uh, there were many pygmy species of elephants in the Mediterranean. I mean, they've got that big hole in the center. Possibly the origin of the idea of the, of the Cyclops. Um, this common sort of f uh, fossil shell was found throughout Europe, which was called the devil's toenail. Apparently the devil has really nasty toenails and needs a pedicure. Uh, these were called lightning bolts because, well, they're pointy and lightning hits the ground and presumably it's at a point. Um, these were called snake stones. They're very, very common all throughout Europe. They look somewhat like a curled up snake. And uh, in some areas, people made pilgrimages to abbeys where, so, so for example, in Yorkshire and Whitby, where there was a famous abbey in which the saint who had founded the abbey, Saint Kilda, had found the place infested with snakes. And in order to found her abbey, decided to clean up the place, struck the ground with her staff, and turned all the snakes to stone. Which is why the stone in that part of Yorkshire is full of these fossils. But of course, pilgrims going there wanted to have more snake-looking uh, snake stones than these, so local artisans fixed that by carving <laughs> heads onto the snake stones. This is some of the ways in which people uh, explain these fossils. Another extremely common one were these, called tongue stones. Supposedly, they look like the tongues of, tongues of dragons. I've never seen a dragon or its tongue, so I don't know. Uh, but this was one of the, the first fossils to be explained by uh, a naturalist. Nicholas Stino, the great Danish naturalist and later bishop, demonstrated that the reason tongue stones looked exactly like shark's teeth is that they are shark's teeth, but that have been turned to stone. So Steno changed the traditional understanding of fossils as just weird shapes that had somehow grown in rocks to they were the remains of things that were once alive and that had died in the sea or in lakes and had been buried in sediment. And so after that, these objects were understood to be the remains of living things. So it's just a cheat, you know, devil's toenail. It's a kind of oyster, right? The lightning bolt was one of these creatures. The snake stone was an ammonite, a little squid-like creature uh, that grew like that. Okay. Now, William Smith the uh, self-taught English uh, geologist who worked for, uh, for the companies that were digging canals throughout Britain in the early 19th century was the first person to establish that fossils were always found specifically in a particular layer of the earth. Never anywhere else. No matter where you went. You could always tell which rock you were dealing with, which layer, by what fossils were in it. If you just had the fossil, that was enough to know which layer you were talking about. They were very specific. This was a, a, an important initial finding. Now, the, the great French comparative anatomist, Cuvier, went on from this, especially in his study of the geology of the Paris Basin, to understand that there were different environments that had existed throughout the history of the Earth with different living things in them, just like uh, Smith had shown that fossils were specific to different layers. So Cuvier showed that you had things like one layer in which there was a particular environment. You could find the remains of the animals and the plants. You could tell what kind of world it was. It was a sort of, say for example, you'd had a Mediterranean sort of world with animals and plants that you could understand. But then after that, there had been another era in which it was the sea. And the, the sea had been present, and there were shells and seaweed and that sort of thing. And then there had been another era in which there had been, it was land again. And you had different creatures. And then there was the sea again. More seashells. 
And then there was another era with different animals. So that in each era, they found that there were different kinds of living things. But not just living things, but a, a unique environment or ecosystem, as we would say today. <clears throat> now, Cuvier was the first person to establish something which we all take for granted, but which was at the time extremely controversial and extremely important. Extinction. None of us would bat an eye at the idea of something going extinct. But at the time, this was extremely controversial. It was re universally rejected. God would not allow something he had created to die out. If he had seen fit to create it, he would not let it die. The fossils of things that were found that didn't match anything that was known had always been explained as being things that lived somewhere else. Well, okay, we don't know these ammonites or we don't know these uh, snake stones or whatever, but they live somewhere else perhaps, or deep in the ocean, which was of course perfectly plausible. Maybe they do live in Asia or at the bottom of the ocean. We've never been to the bottom of the ocean. But when it came to the f discovery of fossils of large animals, like this one, found in the Americas, there was no way a gigantic animal bigger than an elephant was running around in North America and no one had seen it for hundreds of years. And so Cuvier, by his expert detailed analysis of the bones of these fossils, and particularly their teeth, was able to show that this animal was not the African or the Asian elephant. This was a third species, an unknown species. And clearly, since it's so gigantic, it must be extinct. And so Cuvier was the first person to establish and to settle this question for the scientific community that, that extinction is a fact. And here's another example. This creature found in Brazil. What the hell is it? It's gigantic. It's bigger than a car. But Cuvier was able to show from analysis of the bones and the teeth that it was a type of sloth, which ordinarily are these unbelievably boring and unglamorous animals that hang in trees. And, well, they're rather soporific. But this is a reconstruction of what they probably looked like. They were gigantic uh, tree-browsing animals. Clearly, this gigantic tree crusher was not wandering around Brazil for hundreds of years without being seen. It must be extinct. It didn't exist anymore. Now, very soon this message of extinction was basically universally accepted. There are things that used to live on the world that are now dead. They're gone, they're extinct. But there was one person who disagreed with that, who was Lamarck. You've all heard of Lamarck, he's famous for, a, for his theory of evolution. But the way you've read about his theory in the textbooks is wrong. Lamarck's theory is not about the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Right, at the, the, um, uh, the blacksmith pounding metal all day gets huge biceps and therefore must pass on his huge muscles to his offspring. This is the stereotype understanding of Lamarck's theory. It's wrong. Lamarck's theory is actually against his colleague Cuvier and extinction. Lamarck thought God wouldn't allow extinction to happen. Those things didn't die out. They changed. They evolved. So those mastodons found in America, they hadn't died out. They just evolved into elephants and so on and so forth. All those other creatures that were now unknown, they had changed into what we now know. So nothing had actually gone extinct, according to to Lamarck. So he attributed, the, the, so the primary thing about Lamarck's theory is what he called the complexifying force, which is a progressive force. His theory is actually about progress. 
The living world is like an escalator. It's just progressing upwards. And human beings just happen to be the pinnacle of evolution at the moment, but it's just going to keep on, on going. That was Lamarck's view. And everyone, of course, knows the stereotype of his theory about the giraffe having to get its long neck that it keeps stretching and passes it on. Um, but what it's really about is progress. The living world is driven inevitably by a law of nature to progress upwards. Now, that was a very a controversial theory. Of course, basically, Cuvier destroyed Lamarck and made him look ridiculous, and no one took evolutionary theories seriously. But this lady, Mary Anning, in the south of England, made her living by finding fossils. In fact, she's supposedly the origin of the tongue twister, she sells seashells by the seashore, yeah. which I got right this time. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, she's supposedly the origin of this. She found amazing things on the Dorset coast. <coughs> like this. These are drawings <coughs> of the fossilized creatures that she found. Things that had never been seen or imagined before. Giants. <coughs> Here are more accurate or more complete constructions of the two main kinds she found. This one, ichthyosaur, which means fish lizard. And Plesiosaur, which I can't remember what that means. But <laughs> they give all the good names the way at the beginning. Why is it called fish lizard? Because the bones, after some debate, were clearly recognized. These were not mammal bones. They were not fish bones. These were not fish. Well, clearly, it was a swimming thing. It had paddles. Both of them had paddles. But they were not fish. Their bones clearly showed they were reptiles. These were aquatic reptiles previously unknown, like, apart from turtles. Up there. Uh, one of um, Anning's best specimens is on display in the Natural History Museum in London with, with her portrait. I mean, there it is. It's a gigantic creature, bigger than this entire wall and screen. <coughs> a huge, a huge animal. The ichthyosaur has been reconstructed here in the front. And to compare it, that's a... a a dolphin or porpoise, back which you all know, everyone knows what a porpoise is. But the ichthyosaur was a reptile, not related to porpoises. The clear giveaway is that the tail is aligned this way, which is how a fish swims. Dolphins and whales, their tails go like this. All mammals, their spines move in that way. So she had discovered. Uh, these amazing creatures that no one had dreamed existed before. And it wasn't just their bodies that were found, but also their, how should I say, their poo. <laughs> their remains <laughs> uh, were also found. And this revealed something about their life and their ecosystem. So they found remains of what these creatures Eight. And it turned out that some of these ichthyosaurs had eaten smaller ichthyosaurs. So the, what, what it was possible now for the first time in the history of the world, people were able to imagine an ancient earth peopled or populated by ancient extinct creatures. To us, this is so everyday, we don't understand anymore the significance. We've all seen films like Jurassic Park and things like that, right, with all these CGI uh, dinosaurs and so on and so forth. But the Victorians were the first people to imagine a world of extinct creatures. And this is the very first illustration ever made of a pre-human world populated by extinct creatures. There's the ichthyosaur, and he's biting on a plesiosaur, and uh, there's a crocodile, pterodactyls up there, 
they still didn't know what the um, what the snake stones were, so they just put them there as shells. <laughs> they didn't know what they were, so they're just there at the bottom. But anyway, this was uh, the first time that people had imagined what an ancient earth was like. So instead of imagining the earth as always having been the same, has always been having been inhabited by us as having been a history of humans with kings and empires rising and falling. The, the history of the world was starting to appear to be a very different history of the world, one in which human beings had not had a role at all, in which things had happened long before humans had appeared. A later discovery is this. This was called the pterodactyl. Flying finger. Uh, this is the first pterosaur that was found and named by, again, by Cuvier. A giant flying reptile. No feathers, it's not a bird. It's, flying. it's not a dinosaur either, by the way, which is a very common mistake. But a giant flying reptile which had skin on its wings. And many, many others <coughs> were discovered. Many other reptilian species were discovered in these early eras of the Earth's history. And Cuvier was the first person to propose there had been an age of reptiles in which reptiles had dominated the Earth. Again, this is so old to us. It doesn't seem like a new anything worth mentioning. But to them it was new. There had been an age of reptiles in the history of the world before mammals had appeared. Now their understanding of the order in which things had appeared was, was uh, very exact, was correct even in, in terms of modern understanding. They knew that the reptiles had appeared early on in the history of the earth after the shells and after the fish. There had been this long era in the history of the earth in which there were reptiles, nothing else, no mammals and indeed no birds. Birds had appeared at the very end of that. And eventually, the animals that we are most familiar with, the dinosaurs, were eventually discovered uh, in, at the end of the 1820s. And those became the stars, as of course everyone, know, everyone knows about dinosaurs now, but they are not, they're just one family. There are actually lots of families of reptiles. And so these were chosen, these and the other creatures that were not dinosaurs, were chosen, of course, to be reconstructed at um, the Crystal Palace, the reconstruction of the building that had been the home of the Great Exhibition in 1851. And you probably all know this. The, 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 they are actually still there, these um, brick and concrete reconstructions of dinosaurs <laughs> and other extinct creatures. But what most people forget is that they were, re they were placed on the grounds in the order in which they had appeared in the geological record. So they were placed in their order in terms of the uh, chronology of the history of the Earth. Um, there are lots of pictures of these. They're, they're, they're fantastic. I mean, nowadays, of course, you, if you see a construction of the same animals, they look completely different. Because ideas have changed about what the you know what the iguanodon looked like. You know, so they had them as these fat, bloated things that could barely move, and nowadays they're represented as sort of fast runners. Um, here's another illustration again of, of these extinct creatures. But this is all part of the Victorians' first sense that there had been this ancient world before us, uh, inhabited by things that are now vanished, that have gone extinct. But it wasn't just dinosaurs and reptiles, of course. Many other kinds of extinct things were discovered, like this one. This is the giant sloth again, the Megatherium, found in Brazil. And Cuvier, in his investigations around the Paris Basin, found many other kinds of species. These are his, some of his reconstructions. Now, these are mammals, but they are unknown kinds of mammals. They're extinct sorts of mammals. Each one was specific to its era in the history of the Earth. 
the same is true with the, the, the mastodon and the, and the and various kinds of relatives of things that are alive today, like hippopotamus. There were all of these mammals that had existed both after the time of the reptiles, but before us. So what they were gradually discovering was they described it as a kind of progress in which they imagined this ancient world. This is, again, the ichthyosaur, which actually didn't crawl on land. It was like a dolphin. <laughs> they didn't know about the dorsal fin yet. And the plesiosaur, the pterodactyl. And here are some of Cuvier's uh, extinct mammals. But here is what I really want to show you. This is a pre-Darwin coffee table book illustration about the history of life on Earth, which was by this time universally accepted as a progressive story. The history of the life on Earth had obviously been one of progress, as they described it. Right. In, the, in the most ancient rocks, you had extremely simple, primitive things, like maybe oysters and, and that sort of thing. Later, fish had developed. Later, you got those snake stones. They're still just curled up things. They didn't know what they were. And later, you had an era of reptiles. And later, there had been an era of mammals. Again, but mammals are similar to those alive today, but different. Extinct, ancient ones. This was understood as the progress of life on Earth. And to us, this seems so obviously to suggest evolution, but of course, it was not. For them, these were people who did not accept evolution. Uh, this was simply the facts that the history of life on Earth had been progressive, but it had nothing to do with evolution. Presumably, there, many, there were many theories to explain this, but presumably there had been many eras of creation and destruction, one after another. Right? The, the world had been destroyed, and another era of life had been created, and that era had been destroyed, and another era of life had been created, again and again and again. Fair enough. So that was a way of accommodating these new discoveries about the change in the history of life on Earth with their belief that it was divinely controlled. But clearly, the story in the Bible was not the full story. And all the people who discovered this were, of course, pious Christians. They were not going against the Bible. There was no science versus religion in this. They were religious men. Um, here's another one, again, showing, uh, again, pre-Darwin, showing various eras, as then understood, of the progress of life on Earth. So, before Darwin has even appeared on the scene, everyone understands and accepts that the history of the world has been a progressive one, in which life has progressed from the simple to the complex. Everyone accepts this. There was universally accepted because they had just discovered it. This was the latest thing. This was the hottest science of the day. So everyone knew about it. Everyone accepted it. Here's an example. Uh, William Buckland in Oxford. Um, Don published this, another coffee table book, an overview of the state of geological knowledge at the time with this amazing fold-out. I mean, it's gigantic. It's, it would cover this table, this fold-out um, diagram, just to illustrate their understanding of geology at the time. But geology, for them, included paleontology, included fossils. So in, in, in addition to all the different eras of rocks and how volcanoes were, he's got the history of life along the top with these illustrations. So starting with the most ancient things on this side, and the most uh, recent ones on this side. By the way, they're all extinct. And guess what this one is? That one by itself? You'll never guess. The dodo. Oh, it was the only thing that the Victorians knew 
that human beings have driven extinct. They were, of course, wrong. They were, we had driven lots of things extinct before, but they only knew about the dodo, that human beings had driven that extinct. So all of these ancient forms of life throughout the history of the world were extinct, but they have uh, vanished. Um, but they had appeared progressively. So here's a, 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 I've blown up from the previous slide these primitive things that were known to have existed from the bottom. up to these creatures, those early mammals of Cuvier, the whales, and then mammals of types that are very recognizable. They look like ones that are alive today, but they're not. They're different species. So the history of life on Earth was understood to be progressive. And here, at the very top of the geological layers, was the entirety this is still true, by the way. The entirety of human history in that layer there. Throughout the history of the world, there was never any evidence of any humans. All of these eras of life had come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. There were no humans in any of it. Humans that appeared very recently. So the Victorians saw this as a progressive story in which human beings had come at the end, or as it were, the culmination, as the pinnacle of creation, or the, at the, the process of creation. That it, so it seemed to people at that time, what could be more obvious than the, than the history of the world is a story of progress, in which primitive things have gradually been replaced by more um, complex things until you got to reptiles, until you got to mammals, very like those alive today, until you got to the present in which you've got the mammals of today and which you've got us at the very, at the very top. Like this. I mean, I, I could show you images like this all day long, right? This is a progressive sequence about the geological record. Here, the Reverend Adam Sedgwick from Cambridge pointed out, and now I allow, as all geologists must do, a kind of progressive development. For example, the first fish are below in the rocks, uh, below the reptiles. The first reptiles are older than man. I say we have successive forms of animal life adapted to successive conditions. So far, proving divine design. So for Sedgwick, the fact that the history of the world, you, you might say, well, this contradicts the story of creation in Genesis. But here is a very devout Christian and creationist and a geologist who sees their new discoveries in the last 20 or 30 years or so as confirming God's design and God's role in the natural world. And, well, the Bible is not the whole story. And, they, well, they found ways to accommodate that. But this was not a contradiction to... Uh, the traditional view. There was only one man who did go against this conventional understanding, the geologist Charles Lyell. He is always mentioned as the great precursor to Darwin, which he is, he was. But what is forgotten is, of course, that he was actually against the consensus of everyone uh, that existed at the time. Everyone else accepted that the history of life on Earth had been progressive. He was the only one who denied it because he thought that if we all accepted that the history of life on Earth had been this progressive sequence, this would lead to evolution, which he didn't like and he thought would be not okay. So he argued that um, the fossil record just looks like that because it was so badly preserved that it just happened to look like things happened in sequence, but it was just a jumble of a mess. Uh, his colleagues thought this was a ridiculous uh, interpretation. Here is a cartoon making fun of him in which, uh, in the distant future, in which extinct things come again, according to Lyle, uh, the ichthyosaurs have come back. And here's Professor Ichthyosaurus giving a lecture on this ancient extinct creature called man, which he says, what, how ridiculous that such a creature could have 
ever made a living when it has such tiny teeth and ridiculously small jaws. It's obviously an absurdity. So Lyle's colleagues made fun of him for, for trying to deny what to everyone else was the obvious fact that the history of life on Earth was progressive. The museums of Europe and America were filling with thousands and thousands of species of extinct creatures, and they all lined up in the same way. This popular writer, Robert Chambers, an uh, Edinburgh publisher, wrote this book, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, one of the most uh, scandalous books of the Victorian era for decades. Uh, a debate ran about who had written this because it was published anonymously. There is no author's name here. He kept his authorship secret. But this was a kind of evolutionary uh, book, an evolutionary theory, which he said, look, all of this evidence that we now have from geology and so on and so forth obviously shows that the history of the world has been a progressive one. And even this is exactly what Sedgwick and Lyle feared, which was it obviously shows an evolutionary progression. And human beings, he said, are just the latest stage. And after us will be something even better or angel-like things, will be after us. Now, this is hugely popular, uh, but also hugely controversial. So, like this cartoon from Punch uh, illustrates these ladies with duck faces are, are an example of the, the history of, of change. Now, of course, in the end, Charles Darwin had been working on his own theory of evolution for 20 years uh, to explain the history of this fossil record. Because his book, his famous book, The Origin of Species, what it, the title means, what does it mean, The Origin of Species? It means, where do the new ones come from? Right? What is their origin? Now, previously, it had been thought, and this is by the great anatomist Richard Owen, a, a creationist, that they had simply been created in every new era. As, as the world geologically changed, the species that lived there, they went extinct because the world no longer fit them. And then the new world, the new environment that existed after, had had new life, new species created to fit it. And this had happened again and again and again. Darwin's theory was, no, new species had not been created again and again and again and again and again, but the ones in a later era were descended from the ones in a previous era. I mean, uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's Darwin's theory. Um, and this idea had been mentioned by the great astronomer John Herschel, who writing to Lyle had said, well, in your book about how uh, the, the world changes and evolves is so profound and so interesting, but I wish you could have a answered that mystery, the mystery of mysteries, the replacement of extinct species by others. So only at this time, in the middle of the 19th century, did it actually become a, t a subject, or did it become a question that needed an answer? This was not, there are no timeless questions. There are no questions that have just been there forever. And neither is the origin of species. This is a question that's very timely to this time, when it was so fresh in their minds that all these new species had been discovered that had appeared in the rocks again and again. Where did they come from? Once they vanished, they never appeared again. They went extinct, and they never appeared in later eras. Right? And so, as we all know, Darwin was the one to answer that in his book, The Origin of Species. And shortly after his book appeared, luckily for him, some discoveries were made that fit his predictions. He said that in the future, fossils will be discovered that are intermediary, that are halfway between groups that we already know. And this is still probably the most famous fossil in the world, the Archaeopteryx is the earliest known bird. In the fossil are clearly displayed feathers on its tail and its wings. 
but it's got claws and it's got teeth in its jaw and it's got a bony tail. No bird has claws, bone, teeth in its jaws or bony tail. In other words, it's halfway between uh, a reptile and a bird. And this may come as a shock to some of you, but I'm afraid I have to tell you that what you've heard your entire lives about dinosaurs is not true. <laughs> you've always heard that they're extinct. That is false. The dinosaurs are not extinct. Birds are dinosaurs. Every bird you see is a dinosaur. The family did not go extinct. This, uh, the, their lineage lives on. So every time you see a bird outside, what have they got on their legs? Scales. What do they lay? Eggs. So, and so on. So birds are a family of dinosaurs that has survived. So this was perfect for, for Darwin and for his massive uh, international audience. Again, this seemed to them like progress, right? That the primitive, uh, you know, the stupid dinosaurs, as they were depicted in those early pictures I showed you, had been you know, progressing up to more and more clever things. Uh, similarly with the horse, a very highly regarded animal, of course, <laughs> in the Victorian world. Uh, these fossils were found in, the, in uh, North America in the end of the 19th century. And look, they found something that was to them, uh, a, another story of progress. <laughs> and the horse had, could, be under, could be seen in these fossils to have gradually evolved from a small animal the size of a spaniel to the animal we all know today with just walking on its tiptoes. Um, but this could be seen in the fossil record. This is a very complete fossil record. Uh, the fossil record is so mm, incomplete and so patchy, this is not always apparent. But for the horse, it was very clear. So just after Darwin's theory had come out, this was discovered and everyone could see, ah, yes, so this is an animal that we all understand, that we all know, that the horse has gradually progressed. Now, Darwin's theory has no uh, inevitable sense of progress in it. It doesn't, uh, although most of his readers understood it that way. They saw it as a theory about progress. This is how life progresses, or how life, like Lamarck and, and, and vestiges and these other theories, that life inevitably progresses upwards on some sort of escalator. Um, but this wasn't in Darwin's theory, but everyone read it that way. Why? Because they already had that in their heads, that progress was how nature works, right? They had seen it in astronomy, they had seen it in geology, they had seen it in human society, in history, in so many other areas. They believed that progress was this theme that ruled the world or that underlined everything. So, as for the question uh, in the subtitle of this conference, progress, a blessing or a curse, uh, obviously that question depends on who you're talking to and, and which person. That, that question will, will differ depending on where and when you're talking about. But I would suggest that progress was, in a way, the tune to which the Victorian pageant marched. That that was the background music that they believed was how the world worked. And so that's why I have outlined this today, because I know this, this kind of thing won't come up in the rest of the conference. But that the, this background understanding about how the history of life on Earth had unfolded was so familiar to everyone in the Victorian period that they believed that this is how nature, this is how the world works. It has been a story of progress. And now they imagine themselves in what they saw as a technologically advanced era. Right? They were progressing. Things, progress is going on and on and on. Uh, but they had this background story that they understood. And so that seems to me to be why the Victorians thought that uh, progress is what it's all about. Thanks very much. <laughs>